On Tech News Today, Microsoft figured out who's been installing malware on their laptops. Turns out Samsung did it. Plus, a hacking mogul gets nearly five years in the slammer, and academics are freaking out about a huge price increase from Amazon. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, June 24th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Warby Parker Eyewear. Get boutique quality, classically crafted eyewear, including sunglasses, at revolutionary prices. For a free home try on of five stylish frames of your choice, plus free three day shipping, go to warbyparker.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm Mike Elgin. And our co-anchor today is ZDNet contributing writer, Kevin Tofel. How are you, Kevin? I'm doing good, Mike. Always happy to be here on Wednesdays. I look forward to it as well. We've got a really interesting show today. So why don't we jump right into the news? A senior Microsoft executive discovered that it's not malware that's been disabling Windows Update on Microsoft PCs, the ones that they have in, inside the company. Samsung's been doing it. Paul Thorat co-hosts Twit's Windows Weekly, Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific. That's right after this show today. And writes about technology at Thorat.com. Welcome to you, Paul. Good morning, or good afternoon, I guess. It's <laughs> a little of that, <laughs> depending on where you are across our great yep. nation. Now, why has some Samsung been disabling Windows Update, for crying out loud? This is actually kind of an interesting issue because this is something that all PC makers run into, is in that they get their PCs out into the world. Hopefully, they're you know, uh, set up and configured correctly with the right drivers and so forth. And then drivers come through Windows Update. And sometimes those drivers are generic drivers, generic uh, chipset drivers like Intel chipset drivers, uh, graphics drivers, whatever. And that creates a non-optimal state for the PC because in some cases those drivers that were put on the uh, PC originally were very uh, carefully selected and curated because they were compatible with each other and worked well with each other even if they weren't necessarily the latest version. And so I guess Samsung was trying to override that behavior and prevent Windows Update from, in its eyes, yeah. um, you know, making the computer less stable. Hey, Paul, is it just Samsung that's doing this right now? Because obviously all the other hardware partners have agreements with Microsoft and, and yeah. you know, want the right drivers on their hardware as well. I think that Samsung is the only one that is uh, literally disabling Windows Update, which is a fairly radical step. I mean, <laughs> obviously, most PC makers have some utility. Uh, I know I have a lot of Lenovo devices. They have this. I have a Samsung that has this SW Update app. Um, HP uh, and Dell presumably have their own uh, special applications for this kind of thing. But, you know, taking that step of actually disabling Windows Update is is malicious. I mean, it's it, it's a it's a crazy, crazy act. And by the way, I'd say more so since uh, I talked to Gabe All from uh, the Windows team uh, back in March, I think it was, or, or May, and he was telling me that they have a system set up for PC makers where they can join in and make sure that the drivers that are delivered through Windows Update are in fact curated for that specific device, that they will not receive generic drivers. And Samsung apparently has not signed up for that. Apparently, uh, according to your article, there is a disable underscore Windows Update dot exe. What happens when you just uninstall that? Yeah, and to be clear, we should say uh, this was discovered by uh, a Microsoft MVP, uh, an expert of some type, Patrick Barker, who I do not know. Um, and the way he describes this, because he looked into this, he contacted Samsung uh, support, and he kind of did all the legwork. So I want to make sure we give credit to him for this. But um, basically, you can disable it. You can uninstall it. Uh, Windows Update will come will spring back to life, but when you reboot the computer, things go back to the way they were before, which is part of that malware-related activity that I was talking about. It's a real, uh, you know, it, it's it's a little bit like the Snap, uh, Snapfish incident with Lenovo, where the methods they use to make this work are identical to the way that, that malware works in Windows. It seems like a pretty nuclear option and uh, one that Samsung is arbitrarily choosing to do. Um, and yeah. Paul, I'm not familiar with the, the the all the details of the hardware licensing or software licensing agreements Microsoft has with its partners. But I got to believe that this has to be in some way, shape or form against that licensing agreement. Um, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> can, can Microsoft do anything about this? Do you think they will? 
yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it, it would behoove Microsoft to publicly condemn, you know, Samsung and make a big stink about this. I mean, I think this is something they want, would work with Samsung behind the scenes to make sure that this doesn't happen anymore, uh, which is how I, I sort of expect this to all uh, roll out. But um, I, it's funny. I, I, I haven't had a chance to examine my own Samsung uh, Ultrabook to see if this is happening. I do use this tool, um, but... I've never noticed this particular behavior. And I've heard from people who haven't seen it. So it's not universal and it's unclear when it happens or why it happens. If there are specific machines, maybe it happens on. Um, but we do know that for Windows 10, at least, Microsoft is uh, changing the way that Windows updates itself and is requiring users, particularly those who uh, agree to get the free version over the first year, allow that system to be updated through Windows Update. And so I, I, I sort of wonder if that's not semi-related, that they understand this relationship they have with PC makers over updating and so forth, and whether they're not trying to maybe change the tenor and the language of those agreements. Very strange. You know, Paul, the other day, I think it was last week sometime, I referred to this as a <laughs> cup, and I was corrected in the chat room and said, no, that is a mug. Paul yes. Ferrat has cups. That is a <laughs> mug. And I'm curious, how do people, if people want one of those sweet, sweet Paul Ferrat mugs, how do they get them? <laughs> Well, uh, as it turns out, we were actually getting ready to turn on an online store. We didn't talk ah. about this ahead of time, so it was a good coincidence. I, uh, <laughs> so we're going to be selling a cup. So I have a prototype version of the cup. It's, okay. It has, you know, like a, a non-permanent logo on it. But we are going to be selling. We'll be selling those soon, very soon. Very, very nice. I just uh, been handed. Nice. <laughs> there this you go. Gem right here. Even has, even has your signature on it. So now I can forge your signature. I'll just scan that. I'll, do I will, I'll just warn you in advance that that's not my real signature, although I did sign that. It's a very, very nice signature, even <laughs> though it's not yours. Uh, Paul, so you're you're doing a Windows Weekly right after this show. We'll just yes. transfer you right into the into Leo's uh, cottage. I'll just set. stay on the air. <laughs> exactly. Uh, just kidding. Uh, we're going to have to hang up on you uh, to get okay. the other guests on. But Paul Thorat is at Thorat.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Thorat. That's T-H-U-R-R-O-T-T. -T. Thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. Thank you. All right. Got more news for you in just a sec. But first, let's talk about Warby Parker, our sponsor today. Warby Parker is an awesome place to get glasses. And I know because I've been a customer for some time, and I've always had a really great experience with Warby Parker. They have prescription glasses and sunglasses for both men and women. And these aren't just regular glasses. These are really, really cool glasses that have stylish uh, traditional frames. They really uh, have all these uh, sort of takes on traditional glasses that are very, very cool looking. And they best of all, have revolutionary prices. Other manufacturers keep prices artificially high. They can, you know, glasses are very expensive these days, $300, $400, $500 and up. Uh, and Warby Parker was recently selected as the number one most innovative company for 2015 by Fast Company. And the reason has a lot to do, in addition to customer service and great products, with their uh, prices. Progressive lenses even are now available starting at $295. That's right, $295 for really stylish progressive lenses. And they're not just any kind of progressive lenses either. They use the highest quality form that provides the largest field of vision. So if you've ever had you know, the, the, the original kind of progressive lenses, lenses that give you a really narrow field of vision. Orby Parker's a version of that will give you a very wide field of vision, very pleasant to wear and use. And, uh, and of course, all the glasses have anti-reflective and anti-glare coating, a hard case, and they come with a cleaning cloth. Really great product here. You, you have to try it. Uh, it's just... It's, it's actually fun to use Warby Parker because uh, when you try Warby Parker's stylish glasses with their free home try-on program, uh, you'll get five pairs of glasses that you pick, then you try them on, and then you tell them which one you want. It's really, really simple, and they include a special frame box and prepaid shipping label for easy return. Uh, simply choose the frames you want, any of your prescription details if necessary, and Warby Parker takes care of the rest. And for every pair of glasses you buy, Warby Parker sends a pair to someone in need. They partner with nonprofits like Vision Spring. So give Warby Parker a try for a stylish new pair of prescription glasses or sunglasses at warbyparker.com slash TNT. Get the free home try-on and get the free three-day shipping on your final frame purchase. That's warbyparker.com slash TNT. And we thank Warby Parker for their support of Tech News Today. A 25-year-old Swedish citizen named Alex Usel was sentenced to four years and nine months in U.S. prison by a federal judge yesterday. He owned a hacking software site called Blackshades and co-created a product called Black Blackshades Rat. 
uh, which he sold for $40. Yusuf was arrested in Moldova in 2013 and extradited to the U.S. last year. He pled guilty in February, and now he's going to jail. Nicole, Nicole uh, I should say prison. Last time I said jail instead of prison, I got I heard from, I heard from uh, some uh, listeners and viewers. Nicole Hong is a legal reporter for the Wall Street Journal and joins us now. Welcome to you, Nicole. Hi, great to be here. It's great to have you here. Now, how bad was this Black Shades rat uh, download? Uh, how many computers were infected, for example? This was pretty serious. Um, so, you know, the government's saying that at least half a million computers around the world um, were infected. I think when they, you know, were investigating the server, they found that there were over 6,000 customer accounts from, you know, over 100 countries in the world. So the global scale of this was really incredible. And as a result, you know, they had to work with law enforcement in all these different countries just to arrest everyone involved. Nicole, um, so if I read your story correctly, um, the person who created this software originally did it, or so he says, to uh, help in computer science and learning and so on and so forth. I mean, is, <laughs> is, that, is he really standing upon that as his, um, his defense? <laughs> Yeah, I think it was um, it was for the sentencing, basically to ask the judge for a more lenient sentence. Um, so the government was asking for somewhere between like six and seven years, basically. And Alex Yusol was asking for two and a half. And one of the main reasons was he said, you know, I didn't create this with malicious intent. This was supposed to be sort of like an experiment for computer science students who were interested in remote access tools, but obviously, you know, it morphed into something completely different. <laughs> now, you um, you mentioned, of course, that uh, there were 6,000 or so customers that they know about. Um, something around 100 were arrested. And, you know, that's all very abstract. He makes this, you know, this rat, which is a, re a remote access tool. He, you know, ran the site and so on. It's all very abstract. But you mentioned a Black Shades customer named Marlon Rappa, uh, just to zero in on what sorts of things uh, the customers of this uh, product could, could do. Can you tell us a little bit about Marlon Rappa and what, uh, what he did? Yeah, sure. And so I think looking at the customers is really interesting because it shows that, you know, a lot of these people had little to no technical expertise and all they needed was 40 bucks basically to buy this and infect a victim's computer. So Marlon Rappa, he was 42 years old and he essentially used the rat to spy on like young female victims through their webcams because that was something the rat allowed people to do. You could turn on a victim's webcam without them knowing. And you know, the, Lawyers yesterday were saying that he spied on them while they were naked, while they were having sex. Like, this is very terrifying stuff. Um, and another customer that I didn't mention in the story, but he also pleaded guilty, and he was using the rat to steal people's credit card numbers and financial account information. So people were able to use this for a whole variety of crimes. Yeah, it's, it's uh, really chilling when you get into the camera uh, type of thing. Um, uh, Kevin, I think you had one more question uh, before we uh, move on to the next story. Yeah, I'm not even sure if, if um, we know the answer to this, but I thought I'd ask it. I mean, is, was this um, software actually publicly available on the Internet or did you have to go through, say, dark web, deep web and all that? Mm -hmm. Do we know that? Yeah, I don't think this was on tour on the dark web or anything. I think you were able to access this just through like hacker forums and things like that. Mm. So it really lowered the bar for, you know, anyone who wanted to hack someone else. Like it was pretty easy for them to do. Very, very interesting. And, you know, uh, John C. Dvorak, who's uh, often on Twit, uh, on, on the Sunday show Twit, uh, has been putting electrical tape over his webcam uh, lens for many years, and he's gotten a lot of grief for it, but it sounds like uh, he was on the right track there. It's probably a good idea. Nicole Hong is at WSJ.com, and you can follow her on Twitter at Nicole underscore Hong. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nicole. Thank you. We have a little bit of breaking news here. Messenger, Facebook's uh, messaging app, uh, app uh, now allows you to sign in without a Facebook account. So even if you don't have a Facebook account, you can use Messenger, uh, but that's only in the U.S., Canada, Peru, and Venezuela. Uh, again, this is breaking news from TechCrunch. Amazon raised the commission it charges on its Mechanical Turk service. Mechanical Turk exists to match up people with grunt work to do with others who are willing to do said grunt work. Amazon used to take 10%. Now they take 20 The change is causing some Mechanical Turk users to freak out. Carolyn O'Donovan is a senior rep technology reporter for BuzzFeed News and joins us now. Welcome, Carolyn. 
Hello. Hi there. Now, first of all, why did <clears throat> Amazon increase its cut? Things seem to be going fine. Why did they double the price? Um, it's hard for me to say that. What they say is that they want to use the revenue to continue to innovate on the platform. Uh, MTurk has been in beta for a long time, so supposedly they would use it to expand the platform, expand what people can do. Um, but that's sort of all they said in terms of why they were doing that. It does, because there's a, there is a 10 to 20% increase, but it's actually a 10 to 40% increase for people who are using it to conduct surveys, um, which is mostly academic researchers. So there's some suspicion or conversation around whether or not they're trying to sort of edge out the people who are using the platform for that purpose specifically. Um, but other than that, you know, I can only speculate why they would do it. <laughs> Caroline, are there other alternatives for folks who are using um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk now? I mean, are there, are there other options out there that might be um, more price conscious, might, might be cheaper in the long run for academics and others to use? Or are they kind of up the creek here without a, without a paddle? Uh, no, there are other platforms, especially specifically for scientific researchers to use that um, at this point would be a little bit less expensive. I believe I'd have to double check on that. Um, I think the problem is more that you need a sort of uh, collective mass of people who are around to do the work. Um, and you, especially when you're dealing with some of the research gigs, need someone who's a little bit more skilled occasionally. So I think it's a matter of who the population using the platform is. Um, there's also been some, in some academic circles, conversation around creating a worker-owned or, or worker-operated platforms for this kind of gig work. Um, so those have been underway as well, but again, are not sort of wide, as widely adopted as Mechanical Turk has been thus far. <laughs> Sounds like a great opportunity for some academics to launch an academic specific version of Mechanical Turk. That's probably a great idea anyway, whether it's uh, worker owned or not. I mean, I just, I think it's a, a good opportunity that's being opened up here. Now, I, I believe that Amazon claims that there are more than 500,000 people registered with Mechanical Turk. That's an astonishingly mm -hmm. high number. Uh, do we know how many of those are actually active in using Mechanical Turk or just exactly how widespread Mechanical Turk usage is generally? No, that's just sort of a figure that, that they have on their website there. It's not really possible. I mean, I don't have any idea how many people are actively using it. Um, it is used heavily in the academic community. Um, some people had pointed out, for example, that raising the prices for uh, people who are conducting academic surveys would specifically target people who are early in their academic careers who don't have a ton of funding for the research that they're doing or you know, people who aren't backed by um, private universities with huge endowments, that kind of thing. So there are smaller populations um, who very specifically might struggle with the with the price range, but in terms of the number of people who would be impacted, it's less clear. Um, there's also a number of, of forums, it's actually a lot of forums where people talk about the work that they do on Mechanical Turk. Um, and a number of them there, there are people who say, you know, that they would have trouble making their rent without the revenue that they get from Mechanical Turk. Um, some of them even say that they, they live off of it full time, that this is like their primary form of employment. Um, so I think for those people, it's also a, a very specific concern. Wow, I had no idea. Uh, yeah. uh, Carolyn, uh, BuzzFeed News just came out with a BuzzFeed News app, which is <laughs> amazing. I absolutely love it. I recommend it to everyone who's interested in following Thanks. the news. Uh, I don't know if you're involved with that personally or not, but it's just a great resource. And uh, it's a part of a... Uh, a new category of news apps that combine human curation with algorithmic uh, mm -hmm. magic, whatever you want to call it. So anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to, to throw that in there since you're here. Uh, Carolyn O'Donovan is at BuzzFeed.com, and you can follow her on Twitter at CEO Donovan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, guys. All right. The iPhone version of Google Calendar is finally catching up to the Android version. Now, iPhone users can associate Google Drive files like pictures and documents with calendar events. Very, very cool. In uh, other uh, product update news, Instagram rolled out a huge update yesterday that transforms the service. Instagram co-founder and CEO Kevin Systrom told Wired in an interview that Instagram is now a, quote, real-time visual pulse for what is happening in the world, unquote, instead of just a place to share pictures of your lunch. In other words, Instagram competes with Twitter. A new search page offers posts sorted by location, trending hashtags, and even a long collection of posts curated by Instagram staff. Search itself has been upgraded to offer not only search results sorted by how recently they were posted, but also under how good they are under a new top posts heading. Uh, Kevin Tofel, are you an Instagram user and have you tried the new uh, version? 
I am an Instagram user. Um, I look at it every day with my Warby Parker progressive lenses. I kid you not. <laughs> Very this nice. Is, that's Very yes, nice. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I've long been an Instagram user, but you know, I haven't tried this new update yet. I, I'm wondering, Mike, is Instagram kind of struggling for identity to compete now? I mean, it's it came out as a, a service several years ago, uh, photo sharing and so on, but now it's competing with the Snapchats and and the Twitter, as we said, and so on. And you know, I still just use it as I've always used it. So even with this update, I'm not sure I'm going to get more out of it or be more engaged with it, but maybe that's just me. Well, my guess is that uh, Instagram and Facebook, which owns Instagram, is aware of the fact that over time, social media tends to become more and more visual. And I think we're moving through this thing where it used to be text and then it was text and pictures and then pictures became super important. And now people are doing social media with just pictures and videos. And eventually I think Facebook believes people will be doing social networking with virtual reality. But for the time being, pictures are very, very important. And, uh, you know, word based social networking is kind of like uh, withering. Not, you know, that's an exaggeration to say that, but lots and lots of people are happy to do almost all of their uh, social networking and social interaction using pictures and maybe a few hashtags and maybe a few words, caption type things. So I think uh, Facebook is seizing the opportunity to slam Twitter with something that uh, kind of steals one of the ways that people are using Twitter. And Twitter, of course, is trying to become more like Facebook and so on. So, uh, you know, it's a weird competitive landscape with all the social networks trying to be like all the other social networks. And I think this is just another case where, you know, Instagram's trying to be like Twitter. But having said that, I think it's kind of cool where let's say there's a there's an event, uh, let's say there's you know it's the Oscars, and then you're going to go there, and there's going to be a place hashtag, which will be the Kodak Theater, and you're just going to have this live stream of photos that people are taking on the red carpet, etc. And it's going to be kind of a nice alternative to following the you know the Academy Awards on Twitter. I mean, I can see people really doing that, and it'll probably be pretty cool. So we'll see and don't forget, we can also have people periscoping it too. Yes, and meerkatting, <laughs> etc. Well, the news you can use a company called Think You, yeah, Think You too, this week, which makes an iOS contact sharing app, launched a new version with Apple Watch support, which is really cool, and also an Android version. The app exchanges contact info via QR code if the other person has UPass, which is, let's face it, kind of unlikely, or as a URL or V card. If they don't, the Apple Watch mostly extends the QR code to the watch so you can exchange contact details without pulling out your phone. The Android version works just like the iOS version. And the company told me this morning that they're working on an Android Wear supported version very soon. Uh, Kevin Tofel, this is a, <clears throat> an interesting category because mm -hmm. it seems so ripe for somebody to dominate. The, you know, there, there should be a single standard or company or something where everybody agrees and we can dispense with business cards. When you ever get exchange information, and yet every company seems to flounder, and we can't really seem to get a standard uh, going. Let me just ask you: How do you exchange your contact information? Are you still handing around a dead tree pulp uh, on a card? Because I do. Un unfortunately, I am. I, I prefer not to, to be honest. Because a, I don't want to carry it. B, and I, I think it's just wasteful to to have the paper printed uh, for business cards. But it, unfortunately, you know, if I go to CES or some other big trade event, yeah, I've got to bring, you know, 500 business cards with me. So um, the trick is, as you said, there's so many different ways to to transfer information. You know, we have NFC, we have uh, email, we have um, apps that do this, we have the QR codes. Uh, everybody's just fighting for this space. And it really, I wish everybody would just kind of agree on one way, shape, or form to do this. Unfortunately, sometimes you need certain technology, such as NFC. You have to have two devices that have NFC chips, and not everyone does yet. Um, QR codes, everybody has cameras, so that's not a problem. But yeah, I'm still carrying the business cards, and I don't like it. I'd like to see a, uh, a watch standard that is agreed upon by all the smartwatches that actually sends data through your hand when you shake hands with somebody. Uh, and, and exchanges the data that way. I've seen research that says that it's workable. You could do it. Um, but uh, we'll see if uh, anybody really does that for real for, with, with a real smartwatch. Well, in news your dog can use, dogs need love too. And that's why a company called Holodog came out with a dating app called Tindog. That's right. It's Tinder for dogs. You can browse dogs in your area, invite their owners to meet for a dog play date. Tindog is available on iOS and Android what will they think of next, Kevin Tofel? 
Oh, my dog, uh, he has an Instagram account because my kids set one up for him. I'll probably get booted for that, but uh, he will never have a tin dog account. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> That's right. Keep your keep your dog honest or whatever it is, the equivalent of keeping it, whatever. All right, well, in news you could lose, remember Marty McFly's hoverboard in the movie Back to the Future? Well, the future is now, and Lexus says they've built one. The Lexus hoverboard uses liquid nitrogen-cooled superconductors and magnets, and it's already being tested in Japan. Let's check out the video. All right, so we see a guy who looks like it might be California in the background, the palm trees. He's on a skateboard, rolling down the sidewalk. He steps off the skateboard and walks up to a super badass looking hoverboard that has like liquid nitrogen steam coming out it's of it. It's smoking, wow. Yeah. Cool as that. It says it's just a matter of figuring out how. He steps on it, and it goes to the hashtag Lexus Hover. Follow the journey. Now, here's the best part. Lexus says they're going to give us all the details about this hoverboard on October 21st, 2015, which happens to be the day Marty McFly went back to the future in the movie. So this is quite a uh, marriage of research and publicity stunts. Very cool. I don't care how much it costs, Kevin Toffel. I want you one. You want one. I knew you would. I knew you. I'm still waiting for a segue, but that's not going to happen. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, this looks interesting. It does, and it probably costs as much as a regular Lexus. So we'll see. <laughs> well, we'll then, see what, then, then my budget cannot afford it. So. <laughs> we'll see what they actually do with this other than publicity. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Ryan Bright in Tennessee, who recently listened to Tech News Today while chasing heifers out of his cornfield. And there they go. Nice. I hope he's not using the audio from the show to chase the cows away. <laughs> but uh, That looks like my backyard. We've got cornfields and cows here. Yeah. Well, we got them here. And uh, yeah, I got, I have a, there's actually a cow field right behind my house. And when the wind is going in just the right direction, it uh, is something special. Well, show us how you, of heifers. <laughs> yes, yes. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. And use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Kevin Toffel, what are you working on? Where can people read it? I am over at ZDNet.com where uh, very soon, I hope, I will be writing up what's new in iOS 8.4. Uh, probably not too much, but the Apple Music app will be there and that goes live next week. My kids burned through six gig of LTE data streaming iTunes radio last month. So wow. I'm putting them all on the family plan on the free trial uh, for Apple Music and they can download to their heart's content starting next week. So I am looking forward to that. And Kevin Toffel's kids, go ahead and listen to Taylor Swift. She will get paid <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, we don't know how much or, or whatever. Kevin C. Toffel on Twitter. Uh, you can follow him there. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Mike. All right. See you next week. You can subscribe to Tech News Today via RSS, or you can choose another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. And you can watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1700 UTC at twit.tv. Just click the live button. If you're in Sonoma County, come in and watch us as part of our studio audience. Just send email to tickets at twit.tv before you come in. If you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how you can do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on the social media site of your choice. Tag three friends and recommend that they subscribe. And I'd like to invite you to join our Google Plus community. Just search, search Google Plus for Tech News Today and you'll find the community. Sign up. We'd love to have you in there. And you can follow me on all the social networks at elgin.com. Don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every single weeknight. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. The show was produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.